Hello, everyone. Welcome to Kids Discovering History. My name is Mark, and I love history, so you can call me the Mark of History. So if you are ready to discover some exciting history, let's begin. George Washington was born on February 22, 1732. At the time, America was comprised of 13 British colonies clustered along the Atlantic Ocean. The land was rich with opportunity for the immigrants who found their way there and were willing to work the land. America was divided into social classes, the wealthy, the poor, a small middle class, and the slaves. George was not born a rich aristocrat. His great-grandfather was a poor English adventurer who had immigrated to Virginia in 1657. He was an unsavory character, but as Virginia prospered, so did the Washington family. George's father, Augustine Washington, had four children by his first wife and six by his second wife, Mary, George's mother. So little is known about George's early years that his first biographer fashioned a story about young George, a hatchet, and his admission to his father that he chopped down a cherry tree. I can't tell a lie, Pa. You know I can't tell a lie. I did cut it with my hatchet. His formal education was minimal but practical, arithmetic for keeping accounts and geometry for surveying. He preferred to read books that taught him something useful. In 1743, George's father died. He left a sizable estate of 10,000 acres of land and 49 slaves, all of which was split several ways. George was only 11, but he knew that he didn't want to live under his overbearing mother's vigilance. His oldest brother, Lawrence, who was 14 years older, became George's surrogate father. Lawrence was a man of fine character who gave him affectionate and measured attention. By the age of 16, George was eagerly pursuing his first profession as a surveyor. His brother Lawrence's marriage into the powerful Fairfax family became a great asset, and George seized the opportunity to survey their huge spans of land in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. The job was an exciting adventure for George, and he kept a journal about his experiences in the backwoods. George learned to exist in the rugged wilderness quickly. He encountered Indians, learned to cook over an open spit, and observed how settlers bought land cheaply and sold it for a profit to the next wave of settlers. As he neared his 20th birthday, George accompanied Lawrence on a trip to Barbados in an effort to cure Lawrence's tuberculosis. Lawrence had already lost three children to the deadly disease, but Barbados's tropical climate was not the solution. During his only trip away from the continent, George survived his own battle with smallpox. Lawrence never recovered. He returned to Mount Vernon, the family plantation, and died in 1752, leaving George the executor and a residuary heir. The death of his brother and best friend was the most devastating tragedy of his life. Motivated by his admiration of Lawrence, George sought and received his brother's appointment as adjutant of the Northern Neck District of Virginia in charge of militia training. Suddenly, at the age of 21, he was a major in the militia. Wow! He was nearly six foot three. Not only did he physically tower over most men, but also his life experiences gave him an appearance of strength and confidence. He was ready to pursue his military career at a time when England and France were contending for world power. In the early 1750s, both the British and the French strove to occupy the upper Ohio Valley. The French erected Fort Labeouf at Waterford, Pennsylvania and seized a British post on the Allegheny River. Alarmed by these acts, Virginia's governor Robert Denwitty sent Washington in late 1753 on a diplomatic mission to assert Britain's claim. The French rebuked Washington's demand. Washington returned to Williamsburg with his vivid report of the French determination to possess the disputed area. On March 20, 1754, Governor Dinwiddie launched a war against the French in what became the last of the French and Indian Wars. With Washington in command, Dinwiddie instructed him to capture Fort Duquesne from the French. But on July 3, 1754, Washington was compelled to surrender to the French at Fort Necessity. 
News of his defeat moved Britain to send an expedition under the leadership of General Edward Braddock, who appointed George his personal aide-de-camp. Soon, Washington's strengths in decision-making and military tactics became apparent. Though General Braddock often spurned his advice, word of Washington's bravery under fire spread his fame to nearby colonies and abroad. On July 9th, in a bloody ambush, the British were defeated, and Braddock died in battle with Washington at his side. The 23-year-old Washington remained poised and determined, as he often did. Washington survived the fighting with four bullet holes through his coat and two horses shot under him. He was rewarded for his valor on August 14th when he took command of all the Virginia forces. Managing recruits, procuring supplies, and transporting his men was challenging. In addition, he fought hard to assure that his men were paid promptly and provided shelter and medical care. His experience with the British during this period left him estranged. Resigning his commission in late 1758, a frustrated Washington retired to his plantation at Mount Vernon. In early January 1759, George married Martha Dandridge Custis, a wealthy Virginia widow with two children. The marriage united two harmonious personalities and proved happy. Martha was a congenial hostess, and George enjoyed opening his home to many guests throughout his lifetime. The marriage also enhanced his wealth. Martha had inherited a considerable number of slaves and about 15,000 acres of land, much of it highly valued for its proximity to Williamsburg. In 1764, the British were faced with a heavy post-war debt, high income taxes, and continued military costs in America. They decided to raise revenues from the colonies. As a member of the House of Burgesses, Washington opposed the Stamp Act, which imposed crushing taxes on the colonies for the support of the large British army in America. He cast his lot with the colonial Whigs in their cause against the Tory ministries of England and helped pass a resolution protesting the increasing taxation. In September 1774, the first Continental Congress was held in Philadelphia and Washington attended as a Virginia delegate. Though war was not an issue, Washington wore his uniform to the meetings to demonstrate his military experience. The intention of the colonies was to be treated fairly with all the rights and privileges of any British citizen. Unfortunately, the British government was not willing to compromise. King George III wrote that the colonies must either submit or triumph. In March 1775, Patrick Henry inspired his fellow Virginia legislators to reject moderate action. He said, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. By the time the Second Continental Congress met, on May 10, 1775, the first military encounters between British soldiers and colonial Minutemen had already occurred at the battles of Lexington and Concord. The American Revolution had begun. On June 16, 1775, in a unanimous decision, Washington was chosen to be general and commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. The robust 43-year-old Washington accepted the command of the Continental Army. He refused a salary and asked that only his expenses be reimbursed. On July 3rd, Washington took command of his troops at Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was a ragged group, but he was determined to transform them into a formidable army. In August, he sent Benedict Arnold and Richard Montgomery to lead an invasion of Canada. Their purpose was to prevent the British with their Native American allies from attacking from the north. Unfortunately, they failed. For the first eight months, he imparted discipline to the army, which at maximum strength numbered only slightly more than 20,000. He dealt with subordinates who quarreled among themselves, and through it all, did as much as anyone to move the conflict toward a decision for complete independence. Though the British evacuated Boston in March 1776, the war was just beginning. For the next five years, the Americans would constantly be on the brink of complete disaster. Historians have not always found Washington to be a great military tactician, but his unquestionable character enabled him to maintain the confidence of the army and the people. 
His wilderness experience hadn't taught him the skills needed for deploying an entire army as was necessary now. However, Washington was a stern disciplinarian and capable of sustaining morale in the most adverse situations. He managed to work with the inherent jealousies that affected regional groups within the army. When conditions left the men ill-fed, ill-clothed, and ill-paid, he avoided mutinous situations. He won the devotion of his command and demanded better treatment for them from Congress. He was always their greatest advocate. On July 4, 1776, the Second Continental Congress formally adopted the Declaration of Independence. This historic document signified that the conflict between England and the United States of America was now officially a war for independence. In late August, the revolutionaries battled the British and their allies, the Hessians, who were German mercenaries. The Continental Army was defeated at the Battle of Long Island and retreated to Manhattan. In late fall, the colonial troops fell back across New Jersey with the British in pursuit. When Washington's army crossed the Delaware into Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia, the Continental Congress panicked and fled into Baltimore. By late December, the British halted their warfare for the remainder of the winter and settled into their campsites. British General Howe kept several Hessian outposts stretched across New Jersey, believing that was sufficient to hold off the Patriots. However, Washington devised a plan of surprise. At sunset on Christmas Day, 1776, 2,500 American troops assembled on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River at McConkie's Ferry. Along the water's edge, the fishermen of Colonel John Glover's Massachusetts Regiment stood in dozens of boats waiting to transport the troops. Undaunted by the deadly cold, Washington's men boarded the boats without complaint and were ferried the 300 yards across the icy Delaware River. The process took 10 hours and there was still nine miles to march into Trenton. With encouraging words, Washington pushed his men onward, stormed the Hessian outposts, and won the day. The Trenton victory was followed by another surprise attack the following week at the Battle of Princeton on January 2nd, 1777. A pleased Washington led the charge from horseback. He called out, bring up the troops, the day is ours. Once again, the Continental Army was victorious and the British Redcoats were sent scurrying for cover in New York City. Wow! For the remainder of the winter, the Continental Army nestled into a campsite near Morristown, New Jersey. In July, spies reported that General Howe had sailed his army from New York City and planned to land in Pennsylvania. Washington directed his men to protect the city of Philadelphia. On September 11th at Brandywine Creek and on October 4th at Germantown, Washington's troops suffered minor defeats. However, on October 17th, British General John Burgoyne was forced to surrender to the Continental Army at Saratoga, New York. Washington led the tattered remains of his army into a hilly winter camp called Valley Forge, 18 miles to the northwest. The Patriots huddled in crude cabins and battled the lack of food and adequate clothing. Disease was rampant, and before the end of winter, nearly one-fourth of the men would die of sickness. Of the deplorable conditions, Washington wrote, I feel for them, and from my soul, pity those miseries which it is neither in my power to relieve nor prevent. Slowly, conditions improved. The arrival of a Prussian army officer named Baron Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben inspired the men as he taught them to load a musket more quickly and how to use a bayonet. He was a skilled drill master and trained the army to march and move in ranks. In less than a month, von Steuben was able to transform the legions into a group of professional fighters. As spring thaw approached, news arrived that the French government had recognized the independence of the United States and would soon join the war as an ally. Said Washington of the announcement, I believe no event was ever received with more heartfelt joy. On June 18, 1778, the new commander of the British forces ordered the evacuation of Philadelphia. The weather was unseasonably hot as the British pushed toward New York City. From a careful distance, the Americans watched as the burden of heavy backpacks and discomfort of sweating in their wool uniforms weakened the British. Washington then ordered his army to attack them at Monmouth Courthouse. 
Inspired by Washington and using General von Steuben's training, the Continental Army formed a strong defense. The British retreated to their stronghold in New York City. Meanwhile, Washington awaited the promised arrival of French assistance. Over the next months, they engaged in only a series of small raids. By 1780, the men were enduring another severe winter. Unable to overcome Washington in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, the British shifted their main efforts to the south and captured the city of Charleston, South Carolina. In September, Washington discovered that one of his favorite generals was a traitor. General Benedict Arnold's plot to surrender the American fort at West Point, New York, shook Washington. Though quick action saved the fort, Arnold escaped into British lines and avoided punishment. His treason, however, made Benedict Arnold the most hated man in the nation. Finally, in the summer of 1781, the opportunity for victory arrived. In July, the Count de Rochambeau and his well-equipped French soldiers landed in New York. The Americans duly impressed the French. One French officer noted, it's incredible that soldiers composed of men of every age, even children of 15, of whites and blacks, almost naked, unpaid, and rather poorly fed, can march so well and stand fire so steadfastly. By September 28, 1781, Washington's 9,000 men and Rochambeau's 7,800 French troops reached the outskirts of Yorktown, Virginia. On October 9th, the assault on the British was underway. Five days of relentless battle ensued as the French and American troops captured two important British forts. Hopelessly, British General Cornwallis and his men were trapped. Outnumbered, surrounded on land, and cut off by sea, Cornwallis surrendered his 7,000 troops on October 19, 1781. War weary after six years of fighting, British hopes of keeping the American colonies were ended. Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay met British diplomats in Paris to negotiate a peace treaty, and George Washington returned with his army to the camps near New York City. In the transition, soldiers began to worry about their futures. Irked by the failure of Congress to fulfill their promise of pay, in their apprehension, some even urged Washington to seize control of the government and make himself king. An astonished Washington replied, no occurrence in the course of the war has given me more painful sensations. You could not have found a person to whom your schemes are more disagreeable. Washington gathered the discontented group together and pleaded that they not throw the country into chaos. As he pulled a congressman's letter from his pocket to read its promise of better treatment in the future, Washington stopped to put on a pair of glasses. He said, gentlemen, you must pardon me. I've grown gray in your service. Now I'm going blind. In an instant, the cynical gathering was moved to tears. Washington rekindled their honest love of their country. In the fall of 1783, after eight long years of service, Washington resigned from the army. The war was over, independence had been won. By November 25th, the last British soldiers sailed from New York City. On December 4th, Washington hosted a farewell dinner where he embraced his officers and bid them farewell. He then returned to his long-neglected Mount Vernon from where he watched the progress of the new nation with growing concern. Washington observed, I predict the worst consequences from a half-starved, limping government always moving upon crutches and tottering at every step. In need of stronger laws than provided by the Articles of Confederation, a constitutional convention was called. Washington attended as a delegate from Virginia he was immediately elected president of the convention. During the hot summer days that followed, 55 delegates voted to scrap the Articles of Confederation and to design a new government. Most saw merit in a plan that called for a federal government made up of three branches, the legislative, executive, and judicial. On September 17, 1787, Washington joined the delegates in signing the Constitution that outlined the new government and waited for ratification by each of the states. His contemporaries overwhelmingly trusted Washington to oversee the success of the new Constitution. On February 4, 1789, George Washington was unanimously elected the first President of the United States. On April 30, 1789, 
George Washington took the oath of office on the balcony of Federal Hall in New York City. With great deliberateness, Washington chose men to advise him. Among them were Secretary of War Henry Knox, Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, and Attorney General Edmund Randolph. From his executive mansion in New York City, Washington involved himself in every aspect of the government. Vice President John Adams admired Washington's industry and honesty. He seeks information from all quarters and judges more independent than any man I ever saw. Keeping their promise to the states, the United States Congress passed 10 amendments to the Constitution called the Bill of Rights. Within two years, the states ratified these amendments. In 1789, Washington began traveling through the states. First, he witnessed with great pleasure the booming factories and seaports of New England. By 1791, he was amazing, surprised citizens with his visits in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. His industrious devotion did not go unnoticed. Thomas Paine wrote of him, the character and services of this gentleman are sufficient to put all those men called kings to shame. He accepted no pay as commander-in-chief. He accepts none as president of the United States. The population of the United States was increasing, and adventurous settlers turned westward into the wilderness. Washington took seriously the need to craft treaties with the Indians, but Congress seemed slow to act. Losing patience during one congressional meeting, Washington walked out and swore that he would never set foot inside Congress again. Thereafter, he communicated with Congress by written notes only. For the next 120 years, every American president followed his example. Meanwhile, there was disharmony in Washington's cabinet. The political differences between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton gave rise to two political parties. Hamilton's Federalists, most of which were prosperous northern merchants, and Jefferson's Democratic Republicans, primarily southern landowners. The two factions rarely agreed on the proper direction for the government. As his four years in office neared an end, Washington expected to retire. However, Federalists and Democratic Republicans alike begged him to serve another term, and he reluctantly agreed. He received another unanimous vote. As he took the oath of office on March 4, 1793, the balance of world power was in a precarious state. The French had beheaded King Louis XVI during the Reign of Terror. In Great Britain, King George III had declared war against France. In America, the new ambassador from France, Citizen Genet, was being cheered at receptions. Americans rallied for the cause of the French Revolution while Washington pondered his position. He believed that if America was permitted to improve without interruption, Americans had a chance to be ranked among the happiest people in the world. To protect the growing economy, Washington proclaimed strict neutrality. The United States would not take an official side in the war between Great Britain and France. At first, Washington was unpopular for his decision, but in time, the nation understood his wisdom as the economy continued to prosper. In 1794, Washington faced an uprising of settlers who opposed Alexander Hamilton's excise tax on whiskey distilled in the country. They regarded the tax as discriminatory and rioted tar and feathering tax collectors. Alarmed at the open challenge to federal authority, Washington used troops to suppress the so-called Whiskey Rebellion without bloodshed or reprisals. Though Washington saw the growth of political parties as a potential danger to the government, he also saw a young nation that continued to thrive. Washington could be proud. He'd been the perfect guide as the country maneuvered through its infancy. In September 1796, he published his farewell address in a Philadelphia newspaper. He called for continued peace and justice in America and announced his firm plans to retire at the end of his second term. On March 4, 1797, Washington attended the inauguration of John Adams as second president of the United States. He was once again content to retire to Mount Vernon, which needed his attention. Then in 1798, it seemed that the U.S. might be pulled into a war with France. President Adams appointed the 64-year-old Washington to organize the army until the end of the crisis. The war with France did not occur, and Washington once again sought the peace of Mount Vernon. 
He died there on December 14, 1799, from a brief bout with fever. At a public memorial service, Henry Lee, a Revolutionary War hero and governor of Virginia, eulogized Washington. First in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen, he was second to none in the humble and endearing scenes of private life. Pious, just, humane, temperate, and sincere, uniform, dignified, and commanding. His example was as edifying to all around him as were the effects of that example lasting. Such was the man for whom the nation mourns. The United States of America has immortalized its first president calling him the father of our country. His image is easily recognizable over two centuries after his death. He graces our currency and majestically looks out from the huge carving on Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills of South Dakota. One of our states is named in his honor, as well as the nation's capital, which is also home to the Washington Monument, where visitors from all over the world can see the spectacular city of Washington, D.C. Presidential biographer Richard Norton Smith wrote of Washington, to his everlasting credit, George Washington was ambiguous about power. The man who could have been king insisted that ultimate sovereignty lay with the people, however imperfect their judgment. I hope you enjoyed the program. I'm off to discover more history for next time. See you then. Thank you.